Welcome to BioCentury This Week. I'm Stephen Hansen, Director of Biopharma Intelligence at BioCentury, and I'll let my colleagues joining me this week introduce themselves. I'm Simon Fishburn, Editor-in-Chief. I'm Selena Koch, Executive Editor. And I'm Steve Osden, Washington Editor. On today's pod, the quandary facing FDA after Sarepta announced confirmatory Phase 3 data for their DMD gene therapy, the evolution and future of endpoints and evidentiary standards, and a tepid reception for biotech's latest IPO. But first, for many, 2023 was a story of survival. In 2024, the story must be growth. Join BioCentury, BIA, and special guests November 14th on the sidelines of the Jeffries London Healthcare Conference for a special CEO and investor networking event, including a fireside chat between the former CEO of Ablinks, Edwin Moses, and BioCentury Editor-in-Chief Simone Fishburne. We expect this event to sell out. Register today to claim your seat at biocenturyjeffries.com. Well, so we're going to start with a topic that came up last week, uh, you know, another year, another controversial data set from Sarepta Therapeutics. <laughs> so last week, the biotech announced data from their phase three Embark study that showed its Elevitis gene therapy for DMD, which had already received accelerated approval from FDA earlier this year, missed the primary endpoint of an improvement in the North Star ambulatory assessment. Yet the company expressed confidence that the totality of the data would lead to full approval. Steve, uh, you know, are we having deja vu here? What does this leave for both patients and the FDA? So it, it's, it, it isn't exactly deja vu. It's, it's a little bit different this time. But it, it, look, the Sarepta story continues to be extraordinarily difficult for families of children with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, for FDA, and actually for everyone who's interested in biotech and in medicine. You know, backing up, as you mentioned, over the summer, CBRA director Peter Marks overruled the review staff who usually make approval decisions. They felt that Sarepta should not receive accelerated approval for the DMD gene therapy. Marks performed his own post hoc analysis, essentially cherry picked a few data points and granted accelerated approval for a limited age group, four to five year olds. One of the arguments in favor of accelerated approval was that a phase three trial, the Embark trial, was underway. And that was going to provide a clear answer about whether the gene therapy works or not. Now the results are in, and they're not clear, right? The gene therapy failed to meet the primary endpoint. It hit secondary endpoints with statistically significant, but very, very small absolute differences. Sarepta says this was a slam dunk, definitive result demonstrating efficacy. The company says the primary endpoint used in the trial isn't sensitive enough to detect improvements at 52 weeks in the population that was in the trial. But remember, Sarepta picked that endpoint, <laughs> and they've been working in DMD for more than a decade, and they claim to be the world's leading authority on treating the condition. Critics I spoke with, including former senior FDA officials, said the results don't confirm efficacy at all. I think that the best that one can say is that the trial doesn't rule out the possibility that the therapy helps boys with DMD to some extent. The question now is what FDA should do in the face of equivocal data about a treatment that, even though they don't take this into consideration, the reality is it costs $3.2 million. And boys who take it are going to be prevented from ever receiving another gene therapy that uses the same vector. And right now, the only gene therapies that are in development use that vector. I think Pfizer CEO Albert Borla summed it up pretty well. On an earnings call last week, someone asked him about Pfizer's gene therapy for DMD that's under development. And he said that the Sarepta news is very, very bad news for patients. Um, I, I agree. There's no other way to think about it. The question is, what's FDA going to do right now? I think that a lot of people think that you really can't expect FDA to behave in this case like they would for drugs for other conditions. People who think that think that FDA is likely to grant some or all of what Sarepta is asking for. They're asking for conversion to full approval and um, removal of all restrictions, including the age restriction. And um, right now the labels are restricted to ambulatory patients. So Steve, I wanna put some context around this as well. And, and raise a couple of things. So let's go back to the very first DMD therapy that was approved by FDA under accelerated approval by Janet Woodcock. 
And at the time, the data were, let's call it similarly controversial, if you like. And the feeling was, and the statement was, just like you've explained now, there's nothing else for these kids. This may not work, but it probably won't do them any harm. And if it might work, you should approve it. And importantly, FDA at the time, I believe, said, this is not going to be a slippery slope. And since then, there have been no confirmatory trials of the accelerated approvals, a few more therapies approved, and now a different type of therapy. Those were antisense oligos. This is a, a gene therapy. And e even though I do take the point, and maybe FDA should just say that, that there's nothing else out there, and that's going to be the standard, I think drug developers for other rare diseases, which are equally painful and difficult for their patients, look at it and feel like th this, either this company or this disease just has a special status. And I think that they feel that that's a slippery slope. So, Well, I, I, I know that for a fact. I've had uh, people um, have told me, people who have other rare conditions or who have children who have other rare conditions, CEOs of companies that are developing drugs for other rare conditions, feel that basically that FDA is acting idiosyncratically, that it intervenes and has intervened consistently to get therapies to uh, patients with DMD based on criteria that they've rejected for other um, ultra rare diseases and for, uh, for more common diseases. One thing just to clarify, you said that there haven't been confirmatory trials for the original exon skipping therapies that Sarepta got accelerated approval for. The trials have started, they just haven't, they haven't finished yet. Um, and that first approval was in 2016. And again, it was through an extraordinary intervention. Janet Woodcock intervened and she did it against the opposition, the very strong opposition of um, just about everyone else at the FDA who had anything to do with it. And at the time, Rob Califf, who was FDA commissioner at that time, said, you know, this, this is an exceptional circumstance and that he didn't expect that there would be any other approvals for DMD in the absence of clinical data. Well, here we are quite a few years later, and it's um, it's still happening. So I think when you say um, the message for drug developers is that FDA is idiosyncratic, certainly is true and is something we've heard a lot. Like people complain a lot about the inconsistencies, making it hard to predict how they should design their development programs, for instance. But on the other hand, I feel like there's been a lot of approvals in recent years in the realm of severe neurological diseases and neuromuscular um, diseases that are starting to paint a picture of in that realm what's acceptable. I think I think you're right. I think that it's it's wrong. It's always wrong to think of FDA as a monolith. The thing that's interesting here is that we're looking at you know in the case of the first exon skipping therapies that was at Cedar and it was Janet Woodcock who intervened. Now we're looking at a gene therapy, and it's at C. Burr, and it's Peter Marks who's intervening. So it's the same disease, but there are different parts of the FDA that are taking these similar decisions. So would you say, Steve, that the problem isn't necessarily with the decision per se, but the inconsistency around it and the fact that others look at it and go, you know, what's the special source that that they've got here? Well, I, I actually look at it a little bit differently. And the, the way I look at it is we're all these years out from the first exon skipping therapy getting accelerated approval. And there still isn't clear objective information demonstrating that any of these drugs help patients. And that's the real tragedy. And I think that there's certainly there are parents who are absolutely convinced that these therapies have helped their children. But the data, if you look at it, from the kind of objective measures that um, FDA has to look at, and honestly, that some payers are going to look at, doesn't provide a clear answer. It doesn't clearly say it isn't helping them. Um, you know, and I think that the fact that Sarepta got statistically significant data on its secondary endpoints in the gene therapy trial, as I said at the outset, it doesn't rule out the possibility that it is helping them. But one, it's not it's not providing the kind of transformative benefit very quickly that patients certainly would hope for. It's not a cure by any means. And two, it's not clear enough to even know really 
that it's working or to be able to to predict for which boys it might help and which ones it won't. And and so I think that's really what's important because it, it is anybody that's spent any time with these boys or with their parents or or knows anything about it realizes that it's you know it's it's a tragic, horrible condition. There are a lot of tragic, horrible conditions, but this one is especially that way. Steve, what is the timeline that Pfizer's molecule could read out in? Because you cited Mikhail Dolston, CSO and president of R&D at Pfizer, who on the same earnings call had said, you know, we're always sad when someone fails a study, but he said that that makes their gene therapy in a way the main game in town. And there is something to that. Like if Pfizer's gene therapy demonstrates clear efficacy, it would make sense that it would kind of knock Sareptas off. And if it doesn't, if it shows something similar, you'd have to expect that they would get a similar reading at FDA. What, what do you think about that? Well, the Pfizer uh, gene therapy isn't actually the only one in town. There, that was what he the, said, not what I said. <laughs> Just yeah, yeah. There, there, <laughs> yeah. There, there, are, there are other um, gene therapies that are being studied for, um, for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. None of them are really close, okay? And none of them are in the time frame where parents who have boys or have this condition are comfortable sitting back now and saying, oh, well, we've got something else that's going to be soon enough that we could wait because the disease uh, progresses inexorably and fairly quickly. I think that the next readout is we're going to get some kind of an update from Pfizer in June on a trial that's that's just underway. I, I don't have the data in front of me. I wouldn't I wouldn't want to go into more detail without having it in front of me. But I think that of the, you know, there are two or three companies that have um, gene therapies that are that are in clinical trials. All the information about that's in BioCentury's BCIQ database, but none of them are going to be um, reading out quickly enough so that parents who have children today who have the disease w- would be comfortable waiting. Well, thanks, Steve, and thanks, Simone and, and Selena, for the, uh, for the comments. I know this is closely watched, and we were sort of hotly debating this uh, all week last week, so... Um, be interesting to see uh, what happens here with Sarepta going forward. And, you know, some of the issues around the endpoints that they were looking at there sort of ties in, I thought, quite well with the timing of a series of stories that Steve and uh, our colleague Lauren Martz wrote this past week, looking at how the evidentiary standards and how they are measured in clinical trials could be evolving and changing in the future. And so, um, Slee, I was wondering if you could uh, just give us a few highlights from the takeaways from Lauren's stories looking at sort of digitization of endpoints and uh, tokenization. Sure. I think one theme that clearly comes out across two of Lauren's stories is that the future of clinical trials is digitization on multiple levels. So one story centered on the promise of digital endpoints, not only to decentralize trials, but to kind of simultaneously capture aspects of disease that patients care about. And the other focused on a wholly different kind of digital tool, something called tokenization and data linkage. And the opportunity there is really about efficiency. It's about adapting these digital tools to lower the barriers to bringing in real world data sources to help you shore up your data sets, to fill in gaps across the whole clinical trial spectrum from screening for entry to a trial through the longest term trackings of outcomes. And these technologies are, they both kind of, promise some level of transformation, but in different ways, and they're very different levels of adoption. Neither is very close to being mainstream, (laughs) but digital endpoints there, you have at least like small and big companies alike kind of exploring with tokenization and data linkage is still very much um, in the hands of a handful of pharmas with certain capabilities. But Lauren talked to a bunch of, you know, stakeholders, and there was a feeling that The clinical trial system, the adoption of digital tools has just been slower than the overall healthcare system. And that if we want drug development to remain adequately integrated with care, things are going to have to change. So Jennifer Goldsack, the CEO of the Digital Medicine Society, also known as DIME, she said, quote, if you see how much digital has pervaded standard of care today, it just makes sense that some sooner or later, our ways of developing these drugs and bringing them to the market are going to change. But then Takeda's head of digital health sciences, 
you know, he he agreed, but he pointed out the rigidity of the system is standing in the way. And, and what that's going to mean is that where you first see widespread adoption is going to be in certain areas where today's tools, you know, fall short the most. So he says, quote, given that it's so hard to get an endpoint accepted, it's very difficult to then displace that endpoint with another endpoint. It's a really valiant effort that's going to be needed, and you need to have a very good reason for wanting to do that. I think what was interesting across two stories that touched on digital technologies um, by Lauren, one is on digital endpoints and the other on tokenization and linkage, you sort of get this feeling that this technology will enter. It will dramatically change drug development in time. And I think that is the issue is sort of how much time. And importantly, like, you know, the way you've been thinking about it is who's going to drive that charge? Because, you know, what you were saying, I think it was the head of Decatur, it's sort of there's risk, you know, there's a, a, a standard way of doing something. And if you want to bring in a new endpoint or create even a new process for gathering data and linking data and so on, that requires disruption. And even if it's going to be more efficient for you in the long run, you're taking risk by going outside of the standard operating way of doing things, which in drug development is just a compound risk on, to on top of all the sort of risk, you, the biology risk you have, and in these markets, the financial risk and you know, executional and commercial risk. So it's sort of a question of who's going to lead the charge. Um, and who's I, going to I be think, the first one? In a, and I, I think it's going to be a little bit like what happened with precision medicine in cancer, where you're going to see the first approvals, the first uh, companies being willing to lead the charge when they see something where they say, in the absence of a digital endpoint, we wouldn't be able to get this approved. We wouldn't be able to identify the patients who are going to benefit from it. And so there's a compelling medical case, but there's also a compelling commercial case for doing that. And that's going to happen, for example, if you have a digital endpoint that redefines a disease. When you take one of these diseases that's named after an early 20th century doctor like Parkinson's or a 19th century doctor like Alzheimer's, and you realize, you know, that's really just looking at symptoms. And if you've got a digital endpoint that says, no, we can actually subset that bigger syndrome in a way that can't be done any other way. And then we can find an intervention that's actually going to help people and is actually going to make money for the companies that do it. That's when you're going to see, when you have that alignment of things, that's when you're going to see companies doing it. No, you're, you're right. And that's actually been the way with biotech. You famously written about Henry Tamir, who, you know, for a long time, the paradigm was you couldn't make a commercial case out of rare diseases. And he, you know, with uh, Genzyme and so on, he showed that not to be true. So there are going to be some people, and you're, you're absolutely right that what came out from Lauren's reporting was that the first use cases will be diseases where there's no other endpoint. And so the digital endpoint becomes the best endpoint. At the same time, you still need investors and companies willing to go down that road rather than another one and another disease. And this is an area like often when we're debating, you know, new, I don't know, regulatory frameworks or things we're saying, oh, oncology, once again, is the leader. It's out in front. I think this is a rare case where neurology is, is leading the way. You see the most embedding of digital endpoints into neurological disease trials, and they're slowly gaining a wealth of data that will eventually be able to flip these from what they are today, which is internal decision-making tools into something more like regulatory endpoints. And, and I do have to jump in here and say, DMD actually might be the place where this happens because uh, the EMA has authorized the use of a digital endpoint based on um, wearables as a primary endpoint for DMD trials. And FDA is looking at the same endpoint and considering using that as a primary endpoint for DMD trials in the future. Interesting. Well, no, I mean, it seems like there's a lot of promise there. And just to give a comment a little bit on Lauren's other story around tokenization, I mean, immediately when, when I was reading the story, my first thoughts always go to like crypto <laughs> when you hear tokenization. But it was really interesting, some of the opportunities that, that are presented there with ways of making data collection much more efficient, basically getting the most out of your data, and, and also just the opportunities to be able to follow patients to really, you know, track long-term outcomes, you know, in a much more efficient way. 
as you said, you know, still sort of the purview of big pharma, but hopefully that can become something that's maybe more democratized across the sector to, uh, you know, make these trials even more efficient. There was a slightly different framing of the opportunity for digital endpoints in the story that, I don't know, I hadn't quite thought of it this way before, but FDA and other regulators really want companies to bring the patient voice more into the clinical trial paradigm. You know, we've seen a lot of patient-focused meetings and whatnot. Um, and there's kind of a, an interesting opportunity for digital endpoints to bridge a gap between patient reported outcomes, which are highly subjective, often based on self-report and otherwise not, you know, they're squishy. Um, and standard approval endpoints today, and I mean, we can criticize those all day long, but in general, they're meant to be objective, quantifiable things. So by embedding these digital sensors into a patient's activities of daily living, you know, one way you can build a case for their value is saying, well, you have this opportunity to measure in this high resolution way, the things that matter most to patients that maybe you would ask them about in a PRO, but in a non-subjective fashion. So maybe that's another way it can become more widespread. Yeah, no, I think that's that, that's really interesting. And, um, you know, Steve, I, I did want to bring up because, you know, we, we obviously had quite a few of these different endpoints focused stories. So I wanted to bring you in to talk a little bit about the um, proposals that, uh, well, the FDA's draft guidance around single trials and, and evidence that you can add to that for um, getting a drug approved. So what, what what was kind of the takeaway from that guidance? So, so look, Congress gave FDA the authority to approve drugs based on one adequate and well-controlled clinical investigation and confirmatory evidence in 1997. And FDA and drug developers have been trying to figure out for the last 25 years what that means. So this draft guidance that just came out is the, the latest um, the latest instance of FDA trying to figure out what it means. And actually in understanding it, it's interesting because it also gives you an idea for why they did some things that have left people's kind of scratching their head o- over the, the last year. And basically it's saying, well, even if a company completes a, a single trial and the outcome of that trial isn't convincing in itself, w- what's the confirmatory evidence that it can be used to gain approval? And basically this guidance, uh, this draft guidance lays out FDA's thinking about it and says there's a whole constellation of data sources that sponsors can draw on to kind of overcome the uncertainty from a single trial, and especially the uncertainty from a single trial that doesn't have a really clear result. Reflecting back on um, Sarepta again, one of the lessons from this guidance is that FDA looks at it the way I see it. It's like a seesaw. One side of the seesaw, you've got the strength of the single trial. And on the other side of the seesaw, you've got the strength of all of the other confirmatory evidence. And what they're looking for as an equilibrium or a balance that tilts in favor of the benefit of the disease. In the case of a trial like um, Sarept is what that would mean, their gene therapy, that would mean if you, for example, if you miss the, the primary endpoint, that the weight of the secondary endpoints plus other data perhaps is strong enough to overcome that level of uncertainty and convince FDA that something has been demonstrated to be effective. And are they willing to take real world data in that supplemental evidence, Steve? Absolutely. So they list different kinds of evidence that they will accept. There's a laundry list of it. I don't I don't have it in my head here, but one of the one of the things that's on that list certainly is real world evidence and real world data. Um, interestingly, another thing that's on the list is PK and PD data. So basically they're saying you could look at mechanistic data about what the molecule does in the body or what the molecule does in the body of a, of a mouse or a rat. And you can use that as confirmatory evidence, even if there isn't scientific consensus that that's a, a surrogate. If you have that, that data, it can be something that can add weight to an application and lead um, tip the balance in favor of FDA approving something. I should also say that you know, for, for all of the enthusiasm that sponsors and, and patients have for this idea, there have been examples. There have been cases where drugs have been approved based on a single trial and confirmatory evidence. And then later, FDA has pulled back the approval and said, you know, it turned out that they were mistaken, you know, in the most 
famous example of that probably is Avastin for breast cancer. And there could be another one coming up. I mean, when Amelix went through this for their ALS therapy, Relivrio, the then director of the Office of Neurology, Billy Dunn, asked them in a public forum, hey, when your phase three data come in, if they don't support this approval, will you voluntarily remove it? And the company said, yes, so those phase three data are still coming. We'll see how clear or unclear they are in the arguments that get made. Is that PKPD data type that you're talking about, Steve? I mean, I know when you were referencing something that was more preclinical, but um, would that constitute sort of relevant early evidence in the same context as uh, <laughs> as what came up in your Promising Pathway Act story? So you, you had another story looking at the Promising Pathway Act where essentially, you know, um, this legislation is looking to set up a provisional approval pathway through FDA. Can you uh, maybe tell us a bit about some of the hopes and fears that go along with that uh, that piece of legislation? Sure. So so I the story that I wrote about that, I said that that legislation is a cry for help. Patients with rare diseases need therapies, and the system we've got now isn't developing enough of them, not, not even close. So the leaders of companies um, that are trying to develop therapies, especially for ultra-rare diseases, who I've spoken with, Emil Caucus at Ultragenics, John Crowley at Amicus, CEOs of several smaller biotech companies, they say that FDA is making the problem worse and that there are things that FDA could do that would make it easier to develop safe and effective drugs for ultra-rare conditions. Personally, I'm not convinced that the Promising Pathway Act is the best way to do it. The bill would create a two-year provisional approval that could be renewed up to four times. The standard for approval would be basically what it is for emergency use authorization, that the drug is likely to benefit rather than the substantial evidence of effectiveness that's ordinarily required. Confirmatory evidence to get a provisional approval converted to full approval under the Promising Pathway Act could be from non-randomized real-world evidence. I think, importantly, the bill is not limited to ultra-rare diseases. It's not limited to rare diseases at all. I think that's partly because a big push for the bill um, is coming from the ALS community. And ALS is rare, but it, it, it's not ultra-rare. I should also say that FDA is adamantly opposed to this bill. Interestingly, so is pharma, and so is uh, NORD, the National Organization for Rare Disorders. There are other patient groups that are strong supporters of it, and some of the CEOs of biotech companies who I spoke with are supporters of it. I don't think that it's likely to be enacted in this Congress, but I think that having the conversation now is important for two reasons. One, because it can push FDA to make the kinds of changes that I think everybody in the rare disease community thinks are needed. And secondly, in the long run, you never know, even though FDA and pharma are opposed to it, it still might get enacted in the future. The right to try legislation was opposed by FDA, by pharma, by most of the biopharmaceutical industry, and it got through and got enacted into the law. I have to say that it, it hasn't lived up to either the hype or, or the horror. You know, it, Very, very few people have received therapies through right to try. There's not very many, if any, cases of people who were celebrating it as something that has helped them at the same time, since it's not used very much, it doesn't seem to have done much harm either. Thanks very much, Steve. That's uh, you know really interesting. And I know that there's uh, sort of strong feelings on both sides of that topic, but uh, be interesting to see how that plays out. So finally, for our deal of the day, Fortunately, it was a murky start for the latest biotech IPO as Lexio Therapeutics priced its offering last Friday at $11 per share, below its $13 to $15 range, raising $100 million. But the gene therapy company traded down, making it the third biotech in a row to trade down on its first day of trading on NASDAQ. Joining the September IPO entrants, uh, Adelaide Norte and Nomura, both of which uh, remain below their IPO price. That performance was sort of doubly remarkable in, in the sense because it was in stark contrast to the rest of the biotech sector last week, where there was something of a mini rally in the XBI. Um, the index was up 11% last week, and that included a near 5% jump on Friday. So that meant that Lexio was one of the few biotechs that actually was trading down uh, on the day on Friday. It would appear that the next biotech that's going to test the market will be Cargo Therapeutics, which uh, today set its terms for an IPO that, if priced at the midpoint, would raise $300 million for the next generation CAR-T company. 
and value them at over 600 million. So before we go, uh, a quick reminder that you can find the latest episode of our sister podcast, The BioCentury Show, featuring Simone's conversation with Jeffrey's Guild Barnum at biocenturyshow.com. All of BioCentury's podcasts are available on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple, and Google. Kendall Square Orchestra provides the music for our podcasts. The group connects science and technology professionals and other members of the greater Boston community to collaborate, innovate, and inspire through music while supporting causes related to healthcare and education. Thanks for listening this week.